Megalvanen Melen, Joisten here with a video on the Palantiri of Arda. Many of you have requested that I do a video series on the items and artifacts of Tolkien's universe, and according to the Facebook poll, you have requested that I start with the Palantiri, which are major plot points in The Lord of the Rings with a seldom known lore. So, let's get into it. Tall ships and tall kings. Three times three. What brought they from the foundered land? Over the flowing sea. Seven stars and seven stones, and one white tree. The Palantiri of Tolkien's Legendarium are translated from Quenya to mean that which looks far away, or seeing stones. These are objects that take the appearance of dark crystal. If a being with a strong enough will gazes into a Palantir, a flame will appear in the Palantir's heart, and expand until the entire object is covered and swirling with a desired sight. The user is able to see anything in Middle-earth, unhindered by time or space. It seems that the Palantiri's visions are never wrong, but maybe misinterpreted. The visions one could see would also need light in them to make out anything, as darkness is the only thing that the Palantiri cannot pierce. These sights are a main feature of the Palantiri, but the dominant reason that they are used in the story is for communication to other wielders of Palantiri. If done correctly, two users may be able to see each other through the stones. Though sound isn't transmitted, only thoughts and mental activities are connected by the users when activated, according to the chapter entitled The Palantiri and the Unfinished Tales. The chapter goes into further detail about the steps that one would need to take to effectively use a Palantir. If looking into a Palantir for a vision, the user would have to physically face the direction that they want a vision of with the stone in front of them either in their hands or on a pedestal of some sort, while the larger stones may be rotated to face a certain direction. For example, if one was to look northward, they would have to stand on the southern side of the stone and so forth. The widest scope for a vision occurs when the user is at least three feet away from the Palantir, but zooming in on a particular part of the vision could happen if the user comes closer. As for communication, the users would have to face one another, and through the willpower of the users and the linkage of the stones, the two Palantiri would meet and see one another, unless one of these two were already locked in another conversation already. Six of the seeing stones could communicate with one another as they were linked and attuned together. Generally, the larger stones, like those of Amansul and Osgiliath, were best at communicating and peering over large distances. A last general aspect of the stones is that if a wielder didn't want the other users to see through the stone when it is passive, the stone may be shrouded, but the knowledge and ability about how to do this was lost with time, though it is likely that Sauron still knew how during the events of the Lord of the Rings. Again, using a Palantir to do any of this required a great exertion of willpower and strength of mind. Often deputies and wardens of the Palantiri were set by the kings who owned them, and both the king and these wardens may use them regularly, on command, or in times of emergency. Some others who did not have such command over the skills were at times allowed to use the stones, but many people did not have the willpower to truly utilize their abilities. The Palantiri were kept in bowls or depressions on great tables and altars in these different strongholds that housed them. Once again, most all of this information may be found in the Palantiri chapter in the Unfinished Tales, or in the new Tolkien Companion by J.E.A. Tyler that compiles Tolkien's information on such topics. Now that we know what these stones are capable of, let's go through the history of these artifacts. Crafted by Feanor and Amon during the Elder Days, the Years of the Trees to be exact, the Gwaedir, as the Seeing Stones of Eldamar are known in Sindarin, were created. These items seem to be made out of a very strong and almost indestructible crystal. Due to Feanor's abilities, they became very powerful relics. It is unknown how many were made exactly, but the events in the books tell us specifically about eight of them. Of those that were created, the greatest Palantir stayed in the Haven of the Eldar on the Lonely Isle, an island off of the coast of Amon in the far west. It could not communicate with the other stones, but I believe it is one way that the elves in the west kept watch over Middle-earth indirectly. Eventually, some of the unknown number of Palantiri were given from the elves of Feanor's house to the lords of Andune in Numenor during the Second Age. During the downfall of Numenor, Elendil and the other faithful men saved seven of the Palantiri and brought them to Middle-earth. 
Thus, the seven were placed in different parts of the exiled kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. First, I'll go over where each stone was originally put, and then I'll go through each stone's relatively quick history as they fell one by one. Looking at it from west to east, and from Arnor to Gondor, the Elosterion Stone, or the Elendil Stone, was put here, in the Tower Hills west of the Shire. It sat in Elosterion, the highest of these towers. The Anuminas Stone was placed in the city of Anuminas in Evendim, and it served the kings in the capital of Arnor. The Amansul Stone was placed in Amansul or Weathertop during its days as a watchtower for Arnor. As for the Gondor Stones, the Orthanc Stone was placed in the Tower of Orthanc in Isengard, as that stronghold acted as a watchtower for Gondor before the coming of Saruman's so-called stewardship. The Anor Stone was placed in Menas Anor, later known as Menas Tirith. The Osgiliath Stone was placed in the Dome of Stars in the city of Osgiliath on the River Anduin, and lastly, the Ithil Stone was placed in Menas Ithil, later renamed Menas Morgul. Now looking at the history, we will go by the order that each one of the Palantiri diminished. The Anumina Stone was the weakest of the three Arnorian stones, but it was used by the kings all the same. It stayed in Anuminas until the capital of Arnor moved to Fornost, and the stone was thus taken as well. Eventually, after the siege and fall of Fornost by Angmar's hands, the Palantir went north with King Arvidui, and was lost in the Ice Bay of Forukel in 1974 of the Third Age. The Amonsul Stone was the largest and most powerful of the Arnorian stones, but it was still subservient to the Osgiliath Stone and the Master Palantir in the Undying Lands. The stone needed two people to carry it. It stayed at the Watchtower until the forces of Angmar destroyed Amonsul, and eventually the stone was rescued by the men of Arthedain, and it too went to Fornost, and then to King Arvidui, who lost it in the Ice Bay as well. Moving now to the history of the Gondorian stones, the Osgiliath stone was the most powerful of the Palantiri in Middle-earth, and it sat in the Dome of Stars in the capital of Gondor. This setting was made specifically for that Palantir, and its ceiling resembled a starry sky. However, during the kin strife in 1437 of the Third Age, Castamir, the usurper from Umbar, laid siege to Osgiliath and left the Dome of Stars to burn. Thus, the Osgiliath stone fell, and it was lost in the river Anduin. Now, turning our eyes to Isildur city Minas Ithil, the Ithil stone stood in that city until sometime after 2002 of the Third Age, when the Nazgul laid siege and secured command over the city. After the fall of Minas Ithil and the rise of Minas Morgul, the Seeing Stone was sent over the Efel Duath, or the Mountains of Shadow as they are known, to Sauron and Barad-dûr. From here, the Dark Lord communicated and corrupted the connection of the Palantiri, leading to the corruption of Saruman and Isengard, and the despairing of the steward Denethor in Menas Tirith. The stone is presumed to have been destroyed in the fall of Barad-dûr in the year 3019 of the Third Age, after the destruction of the One Ring. Looking at the Ithil Stone's counterpart, the Anor Stone in Menas Anor, served the kings of Gondor for many years until the last king rode off to duel the Witch King in Menas Morgul, and was never seen again. During the rule of the stewards, the Palantir was kept hidden from the public, and unused but known by the stewards until Denethor II, who used the stone to keep watch over his land, but was eventually confronted by Sauron in a battle of wills. This ultimately aged Denethor and drove him mad during the War of the Ring in 3019 of the Third Age, when he burned himself alive while grasping the Palantir in both hands. After the scarring of the Palantir in many ways, only a person of iron will could see anything besides two burning hands in the Palantir. Finally, we come to the Orthanc Stone, which remained in Orthanc for some of the Second Age and for a majority of the Third Age. Isengard served as the northwesternmost watchtower of Gondor, and this stronghold drew Saruman's attention. He petitioned Baron, the steward of Gondor, to grant him the key of Orthanc and the stewardship of Isengard, to secretly see if the stone remained in the tower, and it did. However, in his lust for knowledge, power, and oversight on his allies, the Orthanc stone contributed to the fall of Saruman in many ways, and served as a way to communicate between Saruman and Sauron. The Palantir is kept secret until Saruman shows it to Gandalf in the Fellowship of the Ring. It continues to serve Saruman until the end of the Two Towers, when Grima Wormtongue throws the Seeing Stone from the Tower of Orthanc, aiming for Saruman and his enemies at the same time, but missing both. 
He threw it without realizing its value, and he was surely punished by Saruman for such an action. This stone was picked up by Pippin, but then taken and carried by Gandalf until the Hobbit looked into it and saw the White Tree of Gondor burning while communicating against his will with Sauron. After being saved by his companions, Pippin is taken by Gandalf and Shadowfax to Minas Tirith to help with the coming storm. It is during this ride that Gandalf recites the Palantiri rhyme to himself and Pippin, but before they leave, Gandalf gives Aragorn this ancestral item. The future king uses the Palantir to reveal himself and Andriel to Sauron in the Hornburg, causing Sauron to act hastily and attack Minas Tirith and ultimately be defeated. The Palantir was taken by Aragorn to Minas Tirith and there it remained as the only truly usable Palantir in Middle-earth after the Third Age, and it was kept by the kings of Gondor well into the Fourth Age. Finally, we come to the final Palantir, the Elendil Stone in the Tower Hills. Now this one never really diminishes as the others do. The Orthanc stone is sure to diminish before this one, as that stone stayed within the realms of men, but this one, however, remained immortal. This Palantir did not function as the others did in Middle-earth, and seemed to parallel the one in the west, off of the coast of Amon, as it could not communicate with the others, but it was only used to look to the lost west and to the west that is, as it was so heavily attuned and powerful. Elendil used it, and he was the only man to see Amon in it. But, even though he tried, he could not see drowned Numenor. Thus, that fair land dwelt only in memory. The elves of Linden safeguarded this Palantir, and it served as a spiritual purpose for the elves, as, in the late Third Age, the Eldar would journey there to look towards Amon. Gildor and his company were returning from such a pilgrimage when they encountered Frodo, Sam, and Pippin in the Shire at the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring. The purity of the stone remained as it was never used in the pursuit of power by men or Sauron, and it wasn't connected to the web of Palantiri as the others were. The Elendil stone remained in Elostirion until Elrond secretly had the stone placed on his ship that sailed into the west at the end of the Third Age, so it could come once again to the Lonely Isle forever. The Palantiri are truly poetic and incredible parts of the Legendarium as they depict the beauty of sight and communication people might have, but many such connections are broken by the pursuit of domination and war, except one that is used for reflection. After doing the research for this video, I think the Elostirion Stone, or the Elendil Stone, is my favorite Palantir, as it is used for reflective and enlightening reasons rather than for the pursuit of power. In my opinion, the Palantiri are a commentary on the states of reflection, communication, and domination that humans have in our world. Through war, we destroy communication and the reflections on peaceful days, but instead we should rather communicate more thoroughly and try to protect what has come before. Thus, we'll have a greater state of peace in our world in the days to come. Thank you all for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button as it serves to help both the video and the channel both. Also, let me know your thoughts on the Palantiri and this new type of video in the comments below. Share this video with a friend who you think might enjoy it, and subscribe to stay up to date on my future videos. If you would like to contact me more directly, join us on Facebook through the link in the description below. As always, thank you all for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my friends.